What's up guys, Jason up New Year's Revolution down here in the cave for a second of a two-a-day. That's right. We're doing this show now called the Power Hour. Remember that show? Remember the TN80s Hour Power Hour? Yeah, we're, we're going to do a little bit of that today. Uh, a couple of serious questions on the docket for the day. Um, my man Jackson Wells, who's a uh, frequent commentor on the channel and a, and a frequent uh, email communicator of mine, uh, he brings up the topic of celebrity deaths. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, when this question was asked, I think it was back in December, when uh, Kirstie Alley had died uh, and uh, uh, Bob uh, from Sesame Street uh, had died. <clears throat> uh, you know, we've been dealing with celebrity deaths forever, obviously. And... Um, and as wrestling fans, the majority of us watching this channel are wrestling fans. We uh, we have certainly dealt with wrestling deaths. Uh, I guess not as frequently as when there was a you know a massive run of wrestling deaths you know a decade and a half ago or so a decade ago. Um, and sure, you know if you're a pop culture fan or if you're a fan of a particular era. Uh, you know, celebrity deaths from that era certainly bother you. Uh, Jackson, I don't have the question open because I'm recording on the phone and the question is in the email on the phone. But he mentions uh, Lucille Ball's death, uh, Adrian Adonis <clears throat> and Liberace, all from the uh, late 80s, as uh, impactful deaths that, that he uh, experienced as a kid or, or, or I guess uh, stand out to him in his adult mind. Uh, dealing with them as a kid, and then wanted to know if uh, you know if there are any that stand out to me, <clears throat> and I kind of had to think about it because I I the only one death I remember, and and you you took it, you said it, it's your example. I swear I'm not stealing it from you. Uh, the one celebrity death that I remember coming home to was Lucille Ball, was Lucy, um, because my mom. Uh, along with, I assume, everybody's mom, uh, watched I Love Lucy, right? I think I Love Lucy got a resurgence with 80s moms. You know, it just, it just you know, came back with a vengeance in the, uh, in the, with the 80s mom population. So I remember coming home from school and my mom was legitimately sad about Lucy's death. And What's really what what really sticks in the mind is the is the news broadcasts, which you know we kind of still have, I guess, but you know back then it's almost like they would interrupt a television show uh, for the special bulletin that would freak everybody out because that could mean anything is about to happen in your world when a special bulletin comes across the television. And they would do that for some celebrity deaths, and, and they did it for Lucy. Um, was I a Lucille Ball fan? No. But, you know, I had to watch it by default, because if my mom was watching it and I was 10, uh, I, I was going to watch it too. So that one really stands out as a kid. Uh, Heather O'Rourke, uh, the little girl from uh, Poltergeist, uh, died in 88, I believe. And that was... Um, that was kind of weird because she was a kid. And I think it was probably one of the first kids that I knew that died, right? Real or Hollywoody. Uh, like Heather O'Rourke was like the first kid that I knew that died. And so that was weird because that like, you know, kids didn't die in our worlds, <laughs> you know, when we were kids. So that was, that was, uh, and it's still sad today, you know? And I think it was, um, I, you know, I don't go back and, especially when I have kids. I don't really go back and read about kid deaths. But um, I don't know if that could have been prevented. You know, I don't know if, if they knew what was going on with her at the time. Uh, if, if they, you know, if they had figured it out sooner, would they have been able to save her? I don't know, you know. And yeah, I remember that one sticking out because it was a kid. Another one that uh, stood out because it was, for me, like the first of its kind I never watched the show. I never knew this actress, but an actress named Rebecca Schaefer from um, My Sister Sam with uh, Pam Dauber, right, from Mork and Mindy. Uh, she was actually murdered by, you know, by a stalker. 
And uh, again, another concept that kids aren't really super familiar with. And so, you know, you hear about it and you're like, what? A, you know, a stalker found where she lived and murdered her? You know, that because because I think back in the day and rightfully so. Back in the day, celebrities were out of touch, meaning we could not touch them, right? You didn't meet celebrities back then. There were no conventions. There were no meet and greets, or at least, you know, not as popular as they are today. You certainly were not getting a Twitter reaction from a celebrity, right? They weren't liking your Instagram photo of them. You know, they were, in a, they were on another planet. They were untouchable. You know, they were celebrities, movie stars. You know, you don't you don't get to talk to them. I think I think the best that you could hope for would maybe write them a letter, you know, through a magazine address or something, and then hope that two years later you get something back in the mail. That was it. Like you're not, you know, you're not tweeting a celebrity back then. So the fact that like another person found her and then killed her was was weird as a kid. You know, because you don't you don't do that. You don't find celebrities like this guy knocked on her door and she answered and he killed her, you know, so uh, like that just messes with a, a young kid's brain. Um, and then, like, uh, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Michael Jackson's death floored me as an adult floored me. Um, that was one of, that was probably the most impactful celebrity death I've ever, I've ever had. Um, because that was a major, major death of, of a childhood, uh, icon, a childhood relic. And Michael Jackson was so bizarre and so untouchable and so, you know, living on his own planet that, you know, you, you might have even, even as an adult, you kind of take for granted his immortalness, I guess, you know? Um, like, like Michael Jackson, like you didn't touch Michael Jackson. You didn't meet Michael Jackson. You didn't, you didn't get a, you didn't get an autographed photo from Michael Jackson. You didn't go to like, you know, the chiller Comic-Con and get a photo with Michael Jackson. Like you don't, you don't do that. You know, and, and the fact that he stayed bizarre uh, in a non-insulting way, stayed bizarre all those years, he just became, again, this anomaly, this uh, larger-than-life, you know, alien, right? He's <laughs> a human. So he dies. And sadly, I remember the slow build to the death because it was one of those moments when you come home, <clears throat> you come home from work and uh, breaking news, Michael Jackson rushed to a hospital. And then, you know, you're like scrambling and you're running all over the place. I was. And you're, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting. And then the, and then eventually you get like, you know, I remember Fox News or CNN or one of them saying, uh, we have unconfirmed reports that Michael Jackson has died. And they always say it in that, you know, serious newscaster thing. And I just like sat down, man. I was like, <sighs> like, I was shocked. I was just, uh, and, and we're not going to debate anything about Michael Jackson. Okay. To me, he's the guy that, you know, was on MTV and Thriller and got his action figures and his trading cards and beat it and uh, moonwalk. You know, we're good. We're good. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere else with that. You know, so that was devastating adult celebrity death or celebrity death that I experienced as an adult. Uh, wrestling deaths obviously hurt. You know, Chris Benoit was very weird to wrap your head around. Um, yeah, I remember I remember, you know, feeling sad about uh, an actor named Jim Davis who played Jock Ewing on Dallas. Um because that's one of those things where he dies in the middle of a show. You know, he's he's an actor and and he dies and then they have to like rewrite, you know, the show around him being dead. And I didn't remember in 1981, but when I rewatched Dallas, you know, several times, 
Um, it's always strange to see him in the, the season that he dies, you know, um, the episodes leading up to his death, you know, he's frail. Uh, and at one point I think I read that they just had him sitting in a chair with a blanket over him, um, and not really, you know, not really needing him to do much acting, but he was still on set, you know, and, uh, so like not only just does Jim Davis, the actor, die, but Jock Ewing, the patriarch of the Dallas family, the Ewing family, dies. So that's weird. That's weird, you know, to wrap your head around. All right, uh, so there's a pick me up uh, conversation. Uh, the next one, uh, I, and I don't have who asked me this. I don't know where it went. I'm sorry, but a while back somebody asked me why do I homeschool, and. Um, so now I'm going to answer why homeschool. Uh, you know, look, uh, you got to be careful with this conversation because I in no way am insulting public school, private school, Christian school, Catholic school, Montessori school, Amish school, uh, school from Mercury, Pluto, Uranus, <laughs> Um, I'm not, I, I'm not, um, I'm not talking bad about any of that stuff. I'm not talking bad about anybody who sends their kids to public school or private school because that's the majority of the planet. You know, I'm definitely in the minority here. Am I better than anybody for doing this? God, no, I'm probably worse. Right. So, uh, so let's get that out of the way first. I am in no way, uh, in fact, all of my children's friends are public school kids. You know, they, we have some homeschool friends, but we don't do a lot of stuff with them. Um, because here's a little secret. Uh, most homeschool families are weirdos. Yeah, they're weird, you know, and we just don't, we just don't click with them. So, how did the decision happen? I don't know. You know, Liam Liam was two, two or three years old, three, four. I don't know. When do you start looking at schools? Like five? And uh, we were we had decided that we were going to send him to St. Pius. And that was the uh, Catholic school that I graduated from. Are we Catholic? No, nah, not really. But, you know, of course, his dad is going to send him to the school that he went to. So I remember we went out there and uh, we looked, you know, we toured the school and he sat in on like a little kindergarten class and it was lovely. It was wonderful. And we were going to do it. And um, uh, I don't, I don't remember why we didn't. I don't remember why we, why we just didn't. I think, I think there was nothing that really like changed our minds. There was nothing drastic. Uh, the school was going to cost like $4,000 for the year, I think. You know, we were ready to go. Um, his mother was working. Okay, so this goes back a little ways. Here's my selfie stick. I don't know why I just picked this up and started playing with it. But let's go back to when she became a stay-at-home mom. Uh, the kid was uh, born, like uh, probably about six months old when she went back. I don't know how late long moms stay out of work. We do things so non-traditionally here that I don't even know the baseline. So whenever she was to go back to work, I don't know, three months old, I don't know, we t we brought him to a, we found a, um, a stay-at-home mom daycare provider. And uh, we, um, we met and, and interviewed, you know, a homeschool, a uh, homeschool, a stay-at-home mom, uh, who was doing some daycare. I think she had like one or two kids. It wasn't like a big daycare. And so I would drop Liam off at, you know, like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. His mother would pick him up at 4.35. She could, she, we did that for three weeks. And we're like, mm -mm, no, I, I don't enjoy this. And so she quit her job and uh, has not worked since. <laughs> so for 10 years now, uh, I have been a uh, sole provider financially. And things have gone in a great direction in that department, so that's all good, whatever. So that's that's kind of like, that kind of like gave a little indication of who we were as parents. You know, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't do the daycare thing, couldn't drop him off, couldn't let him go, just had to bring him home. 
so then it, the, so then school time comes around and like i said we were we were picking um the school that i went to we toured it we met we had the bill ready to go all good and at the same time the whole time we were considering other options and homeschooling was one of them and she just did a ton of research and um and found you know curriculums and uh we for no reason like for no like big reason we just decided to try that and i think it was going to be maybe a year or two i think we were going to homeschool kindergarten or something i don't know i don't remember but we like transformed the basement into a schoolroom. we hung up boards we hung up posters she got a ton of you know you buy a curriculum right you're not just we're not just pulling this out of our ears you know there's a curriculum we get textbooks you know it's a, it's a real thing um and in fact it's more real in new york because they they standardize it and regulate it and he has to take uh like new york state certified tests like new york is in our business right it's one of like 10 states that regulates it which is fine whatever um so yeah, we spend a ton of money on curriculum, a ton of money on like decorate, you know, decorating the room down here, his school room. And uh, we did it. And, uh, you know, she was off and running. And, and, uh, and then it just stuck. And each year you get another curriculum. And for the early years, first grade, second grade, cake, right? It's like cake as in, we don't have to do a lot of research into, you know, how to spell and, but we have to learn how to teach how to spell and, and guess what? Teachers go to school for that kind of thing and teachers have experience and they have methods and they have tricks and they have gimmicks and we had to figure out all that stuff out. Um, and has it been uh, foolproof? Oh my God. It, it's it's been awful <laughs> is what it is. Um, you know, you, Liam is not a go-getter. He's not a uh, self-motivator. We have to motivate him with arguments and bribes and punishments. Um, but guess what? Guess what was happening? He was learning and he was reading and he was writing and he was telling me, you know, hey, dad, today I learned about, you know, uh, the Revolutionary War. You know, and I think homeschool people are overly active because they want to they, they, they don't want to feel like their kid is not getting, you know, a social life. So we're overactive with homeschool groups meetups at libraries, library, you know, libraries will put on a homeschool class where, you, where they'll go and they'll teach. Our, our local zoo does a homeschool group where you, where you learn about animals. There's homeschool bowling, there's um, park meetups, there's a, like a ton of stuff. And for a while he was doing stuff five days a week because when you have them in first grade, the, the at-home schooling is like two hours and then it's all social. So you just, you know, he was never home during the day. And I was like, what, where's the schooling? Like, and the schooling was quick. And then you go play, like, with your friends. So fast forward to uh, last year. So now Finley is being homeschooled, obviously. So now it's his turn for his mother to bring out all of the... Uh, bring out all of the, you know, the, the curriculum from Liam's first couple of years. Bring out all the gimmicks the flashcards, the, the blocks to do math. They're all out now. She's doing him. So the idea with my kid, with Liam, my kid, they're both my kid, I promise. But with the idea with Liam was that he would be, you know, a lot of homeschool kids eventually get to the point where they're self-sufficient. They're teaching themselves. He's not there yet, right? Not because he he can't get it, but because he doesn't want to get it, right? If, if, if I left him in a, in a, you know, basement classroom uh, with a science book, and a pencil, um, I'd come down two hours later and I think he would have eaten the science book, you know, played the drums, you know, his phone battery died uh, and he's digging a hole like to escape the basement. That's, it you know, that's what he would have done. So there's no way that she can teach him now. So 
dad steps up and says, all right, uh, I can I can adjust my work schedule because of self-employment. And from 9 a.m. until noon, 1230 or one, it varies four days a week from. Let's, so, so, so let's say from 9 to 1230, I am Liam's fifth grade teacher. And so now now we're talking fifth grade. OK, and all you smart parents out there, don't be like fifth grade. That's easy. No, -uh. no, you got you got to learn what you're talking about. So you want to talk about, you know, early settlers in the U.S. and Spain's settlements and France's settlements and then Britain's settlements, the 13 colonies. And you want to talk about all the conflict there. And you want to talk about, you know, events that led up to more of a detailed uh, revolutionary war then you got to learn that stuff. So a lot of Sunday nights, I am sitting around reading fifth grade social studies. Um, I, at this point, have been able to teach fifth grade math perfectly. Okay, but there will come a time, possibly in fifth grade, likely in sixth grade, that I am going to need a tutor uh, for myself. So I will pay somebody to meet with them a half hour a week and teach me chapter five, okay? And then I will, I will teach chapter five. Uh, down the road, uh, he'll likely get, as the kids get older, they'll likely get into more of a, a homeschool co-op thing where they actually go to a place and sit in a classroom with other homeschool kids. And, you know, the parents teach and tutors come in and teach. So, you know, more of a classroom setting. Um, Okay, so and, and I can tell you this, uh, it, with the utmost sincerity, uh, it is the proudest moments of my existence is not only being able to learn enough to teach. Learning is one thing. Learning to teach, all different story, folks. So I am proud that I am able to learn, teach, and then watch him get it. And it's an absolutely... Um, Mm, it's a, it's just, I mean, it, obviously it's hard to explain. It's, it's just, it's just an incredible, you know, feeling. Uh, so I get like how teachers are proud and how teachers walk out of the classroom going, man, I, all those kids knew exactly what I was talking about today. They got it. And more importantly, they spit it back out on a test a week later. Um, it's not always like that. It's not always like that. It is very frustrating when we're doing, you know, some math and, you know, the stuff that he learned last year and mastered might sneak up again this year in review. And then he's staring at like basic division on the on the board and he's like, what do I do? And I'm like, come on, dude, it's like two divided by 24. You know, does he know that it's 12 right away like that? No. But, you know, OK, dude, how many twos go into two? And then he's like two. And I'm like, damn it. You know, so it, it gets it gets frustrating sometimes. Um, his retention is not fantastic uh, because, again, I just don't think he you know gives a poo about it. So, but he's he's fine. He's he's great. Uh, he would be likely. So, so the, the the other interesting thing with with my homeschool class is that he doesn't get questions wrong because as he's as he's like doing something. And, you know, I'm like, uh, he's like, you know, we're learning about esophagus and, you know, that's science. So each side, so our science is, you know, body related right now, this lesson or whatever. And he's like, I don't know, you know, the esophagus, uh, you know, is, you know, you have, you have, you have matching or whatever. And he's, he's about to match uh, esophagus with the definition of intestine. And, and that's not an actual situation. I'm giving you an example. I'm going to go, uh, uh uh, 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 and then he'll be like, oh, oh, okay. And then he'll get it right. So like, he's like an A plus hundred percent student because I, I like, don't, you know, no, 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 that's not, no, think about it. Think about it. And he's like, oh, okay. I think if he was left alone in a classroom and, and they, you know, used a traditional grading system, he'd probably be about a B student, maybe a C plus in some classes. Um, he, you know, in like all kids, cause I don't, I, you know, you make a foolish mistake in math, you're, you're done for the whole problem, right? You know, if you, if you accidentally say 10 minus seven is four, um, 
and you've got like four more parts of that problem to do, you're done. Like you're messed up. You're going to get the wrong answer and, and, and he's not catching it, you know, so I, I catch it and then he, and then he fixes it and he's fine. So anyway, long story short. Okay. Long story long. So I know that some of you are like, well, mm -mm, no, this ain't good. This ain't good. What about the social life? Well, again, they have a more active social life than many kids that I know. Uh, many kids that I know, uh, their friends, um, will be on Roblox, Fortnite, or Minecraft uh, from 9 a.m. Saturday until 11 p.m. Saturday. And uh, my guys don't do that. Uh, they play, but they have, you know, they're active. Uh, they, they, we make them active, you know, so they, they play with their friends. They have a good group of friends. Um, they're in bowling leagues. They play baseball. They do a ton of homeschool get togethers and meetups. Um, we were supposed to do like a winter fest today, but it was raining, you know, with a bunch of kids and, you know, it's good. Now, on the social side, do they know some of the things? Does my does my ten year does Liam know some of the things that ten year olds know? Absolutely not. And I don't care what anybody says. I'm okay with that. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't subscribe to the belief that well, they've got to find out somehow. Mm. Now, in my field, I've seen the damage what can happen when they got to find out somehow actually happens. So I don't. I don't do that. Um, I don't need him to know what, uh, what sex is at 10 years old. I don't need him to know what making out means at 10 years old. I don't know. I don't need him to know what even, you know, pot or, or vaping is at 10 years old. I don't need him to know that. And so I'm not, you know, I'm fine with him not being exposed to those kinds of things. Um, he'll know about those things when, when he needs to you know, at a, at a normal age. And, you know, there's a, he's got a little friend at bowling who is a female and uh, expressed that she has a crush on him. He has no idea what to do with this. And he sees her as a friend, which is fine. Um, but she's, you know, like she's, in, she's, she's 13 and Liam is like going to be 11 in a few months, but he's a very young 11 or very young 10. Um, so like, I don't think I have to have any kinds of conversations with him at this point, but this is a, you know, an example of what to deal with in the future. Um, you know, if, you know, if something like this comes up. So anyway, um, yeah, so that's, that's why, and, and there was, there's a few examples. Look again, I've, I've done this therapy thing for 20 years and I've heard all kinds of stories and yes, they are, uh, not the norm but they're becoming more and more the norm. And uh, I, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't want to do it. You know, I got one shot with these kids and I don't want to throw them out there yet into this world and expose them to all kinds of things that we, that I don't need them exposed to. Did we go through it in the eighties and we did okay? Sure. Yeah, I know. I get the counterpoint, you know, I get it, but you know, I'm sticking with, with my, uh, fundamentals on this one. Um, what else? That's it. <laughs> oh yeah. No, 20 years of business, uh, counseling, mental health. And there's just been so many sad stories of kids. Um, I have had kids commit suicide. I have had, um, horribly bullied kids. I have had sexually assaulted children. Uh, we had a principal here locally that uh, was finally just caught and uh, jailed for molesting uh, students over a 18, 20 year span, uh, middle school kids and younger. Um, I don't need it. I don't need it. You know, uh, every kid and, you know, I, I, I just don't need it. I don't, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to deal with it. My, my heart can't deal with it. My soul can't deal with it. Um, I'm not the kind of parent that's like, see, look at me, I'm rocking back and forth. I'm getting fired up. Um, I'm not, I'm not the kind of parent that's like, well, you know, little, little Johnny, little Johnny just bullied the heck out of my kid, uh, you know, stomped his head on the playground and, hey, you gotta dust yourself off, kid. No, uh, sadly, I'm the kind of dad that 
shows up at the school and uh, assaults little Johnny, his mom, his dad, and his grandma. Um, <laughs> no, I, no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, no. Anyway, uh, it's it's been the best uh, run for me with this homeschooling thing. It's awesome. I don't know what it's going to look like in middle school. I don't know what it's going to look like in junior high, high school. I don't know calculus. I don't know chemistry. That's going to be tough. But I think that's when we start bringing in people or he goes to these co-op deals. Anyway, there's your answer. Longest, longest answer in the world. You got a little bit of insight into me and homeschooling. Um, share your opinions if you want. That's fine. Uh, share them respectfully. You know, uh, I'm sure the friends of the channel are all kind and respectful. I'm sure that somebody who's not a friend of the channel will come in and be like, ah, you suck. Fine. You know, your comment's going to last about three seconds and then you're gone. But um, I don't know, man. Uh, bottom Moral of the story, bottom line, I got one shot at these kids. I got one shot one chance, you know, to, um, to make sure they're okay. As long as I can, you can't make them okay forever. You can't watch them forever. You got to let them go. I get it. I get all the arguments, but at this point I still have them in my hands and, uh, I'm going to work that until, until I don't. So yeah, there you go. There's your answer. Uh, we'll see y'all next time. Good night now.